Well, we may have uh, fewer people, but uh, fine by me. Um, I know a few have already uh, emailed me. They will miss the class because of um, travel or work. So that, that will be us. Um, so let's get started, shall we? Great. Uh, help yourself with coffees. Oh, Wes is not. Maybe. Any, anybody see Wes? Wesley. Last time he was in this group. You're saying same group? Yep. Anyway, maybe he will pop in. Maybe not. All right, today's agenda, all about exploratory data analysis. So uh, a little bit of review. If you remember last time we had the team-based competition case study, right? We analyzed the telco company case. The company is in the telecommunication business and the, the specific business unit was the, what? Landline businesses. So this is old school landline phones that's important to the company. Or the case may be old, but uh, the data analytics tools are never old. You know, we can adapt and using the classic case just to make it easier to learn. Um, so what's for today? Uh, last time I asked you to do various explorations on your own. You know, some might have uh, had some heads up. Uh, you know, they learned uh, uh, sooner than, than others and explored. Or some had uh, already had uh, uh, quite, a, quite a lot of experiences using SAS and other softwares like John. So their team is a little bit advantaged. I'm sorry for the rest of the, the teams, but hey, take it easy. We'll have other bonus bonus opportunities. Yeah, but uh, uh, what I'm here for is to show you how to do them. You know, um, I will follow the slides, but uh, uh, along with the slides, I will show you in SAS, uh, EM mostly, but as well as EG, sometimes we need the EG to generate additional uh, graphs, and something else. Um, I'll show you how to do them. So I will pause and then demo sense along the way. Hopefully you will uh, follow me when, when, I, when I do the SAS, because a lot of it is what you need to do in the homework, right? So essentially I'm showing you how to do the homework, not exactly following the homework uh, questions, but you know, the skills as well as the, the graph you know, will, will, be look, will look exactly the same for, for homework. So that's today. Okay, uh, a little bit of a high level summary of uh, what we are doing now. We are going deep into the data and we're going into the software, but don't lose sight of why we do that. Uh, if you remember the, the process model for data mining, there are six stages or phases. And if you downloaded the slides from Blackboard, your numbers might be slightly you know, incorrect. So these are the correct numbers of the stage, uh, stage orders. Now, uh, stage three is data uh, preparation and, and processing or pre-processing, that is actually the, the, the content of chapter two, which was the, the focus of two weeks ago. Right? I talked about major, major, uh, major sections of that chapter is our missing values, why, that, why missing values occur, and best approaches and alternatives that we have, and pros and cons of, the, of those different approaches to deal with missing values. Another big, big point would be, um, let's see, missing values, uh, standardization. You know, why do we need to do standardization? And two ways, essentially, two ways of standardization uh, of, of numeric variables. I also talk about binning. You know, binning can be applied to both interval variables and, and class variables, although by different ways and different purposes. 
and then there's various other other topics along the uh, pre-processing. It, it, it's it's a diverse topic area because you know data come with different problems, so you need a, a wide range of uh, tool sets to deal with that. So that's that's the focus of stage three. Now stage four is building models. That stage is based on a good understanding of the project uh, focus and, and uh, objective as the result of the first stage and a good understanding of the data set and the business context and being able to connect those two in, as a result of stage two. And after the data ha have been completed, completely con collected and cleaned, pre-processed and prepared as a result of stage three. Now the stage four will be modeling, building models by using the insights learned from stage two and three. And then post-model stage would be to evaluate the different models. You typically do not only train one model, but multiple models that you can compare with um, and select the best one. And then the last stage will be simply to make a decision of whether to implement it and uh, implement the, the, either the result or the report into real business. And today's topic will be stage two. So data understanding, which is basically what you did last time, uh, you know, linking business to data and then go into the data. And this stage is actually before the topic we talked about two weeks two weeks ago, but we did the topic two weeks ago on stage three, just because um, you know there are certain things we had to clear out, you know, to to prepare you to better learn this stage actually. Any questions about this uh, process model? You know, if you downloaded the hey Hami, uh, if you downloaded the slides, the numbers are off, so you will have to, you know, manually correct those. Now, uh, data understanding, including the exploratory data analysis tools, they are good for what? To understand the data set. And one, one use of it is that, you know, if you, as, depending on your role, if you are an internal employee of the company, but recently take on the additional duty to analyze the data sets and to you know, embark on a new data mining project, and you are the informant in that, in that project, then you will have known a lot about the businesses. You may not necessarily know a lot of the data set, what's in the data set, but you have you know, you must have some bit senses about, you know, what might some something look like. You know, if, if you're if you're familiar with the telecommunication company and the landline business, particularly, you will you will have a notion of how does you know customer service calls affect churn rate. You probably have the sense. At least you can you can talk a lot more about that than than another person who is only familiar with the data analytics but not particularly familiar with the telecommunication industry, right? So you can talk about that. And so this stage would be for you as, as in that particular role to be able to connect the businesses to the data and you're in, the, in a position to evaluate the quality of the data, you know, because you have a strong business sense if you generate a data, uh, a data analytic, uh, like graph, to, and you try to confirm your business notion uh, with the, the graph and you see something awkward, that's where you can assert the data has some problem. And there, there's some example here, uh, as well as part of the homework one, that you must have uh, you know, dealt with it. You know, there's some problem with the area code, and we'll talk about that now. Uh, you know, in a minute. So that's one scenario. The other is, you know, flip the coin. If you are a data analyst, you have worked on different kinds of, uh, you know, data sets, like a financial data set, 
and uh, uh, other marketing data set, energy data set, and logistics, but you're not particularly familiar with telecommunication, then this is a stage for you to, un to understand the business. You, know, you come from the data perspective, but try to understand the business to be able to work the business unit. So you know, from, from different perspectives, and this stage is very helpful, but it takes time. You know, so overall, the majority of time are spent in this stage, because if this stage is, is done wrong, garbage in, garbage out, right? Doing, doing the data modeling prematurely without, you know, bully, without being fully you know, um, delved into the, the data and the business and, and making a connection between them is dangerous. And, and you know, having a, a good sense of what a good model is means typically when we say a, a model is good, it starts with including the, 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 the right variables. If you exclude the, the most important variable in the model, the model is not good to start with. So after going through the exploratory data analysis, you have a sense of what variables are very important. You don't, you don't want to leave that out, right? He named two variables that turn out to be you know, seemingly significant from previous week, two variables. It can be categorical, it can be continuous. International plan. International plan, exactly. And something about customer. Customer service call. Exactly, yeah. So, and, and there are more than that, but uh, just uh, ask for two. Um, you know, in a good model, you don't want to leave those out. And uh, approaches is SAS, you know, EG, EM, as well as some, you know, Tableau. If Tableau is better, you know, you can switch Tableau, you know, whatever tool that, that makes sense and, and efficient. Okay, this is what I mean by, you know, somebody coming from the business perspective and trying to understand the data they can evaluate the quality of the data by their business notion. You know, the business notion they have, without even looking at the data, only you know, only knowing what variables are captured in data, but without generating any graph, the business sense or so-called hypotheses or assumptions in a, in a different term, but meaning mean the same thing. You know, the it, it's a business notion. You know, if, if the business notion about a customer who is, who is angry could make a, a lot of uh, customer service calls and still not being satisfied, or he or she may just race to, you know, uh, drop out. In both cases are possible. That's why we see that there's a good proportion of people in the in that uh, zero customer service call bar still churn. It's not because customer service call is bad because they never made a call out of the email. Maybe Google helps, but I, I, don't, I don't think so. He has a number he will call if he needs it, but he didn't call. Something else must have happened, you know, that, that made it happen. So uh, it has two two kind of conditions, but under the condition that somebody made a call but is not satisfied, he will continue calling until he's had too much. So that's the that's business sense and you can, you can test the, the, the relationship between customer service call and churn rate by using EDA to test the, to test the hypothesis. If it's confirmed, data seems to be all right. You know, if it's very surprising, if there's a very surprising pattern going on, which cannot be explained well by the business senses, something else may be going on. You know, you may have to enrich your business senses, or the data might be a problem. So that's possible. And uh, I have talked about these. You know, uh, so EDA is not only used by one approach or the other. It can be fitted to 
fulfill different purposes. But still, it's the, the early stage of data mining project. It's, you know, it's early stage. It doesn't mean that once you are in the modeling phase, you don't do any EDA now, but you will recursively visit back to get additional insights from the data set. But at that moment, your purpose is not to evaluate the data, but to try to you know, make a better model. So the purposes are different. Okay, so uh, by going through examples on this data set, now this data set is churn data set, how many, uh, this is quick back maybe, uh, how many rows are is in the data set? It's not a quiz, it's just, a, you know. Oh, back. Huh? Is this how many records? Is how many records? Data? Not from these screenshots, but that's the same data set you worked on last week. Do you remember how many data sets are there? Uh, how many rows? Well, we'll see the from the oh, it's over there. Okay. I didn't see. <laughs> so good work if you catch it uh, not being intimidated. But anyway, okay, 3,000 rows. Um, and I think that aspect turned out um, last week. You know, we talked about, I asked how many, how many rows, and uh, some teams found out. Um, and uh, there are maybe 15, 20 uh, variables. And these are, you know, and the majority of the variables are interval variables about number of calls, number of uh, minutes, and the uh, uh, amount of charge by different segments of the day. You have day, cause, minute, charge. You have evening, uh, call, minute, charge. You have night, call, minute, charge. International, call, minute, charge. And you have uh, several dummy variables, which is, you know, um, flag variables. Um, and you have a target variable which is also a dummy variable. You have uh, area code. You have voice message, number of voice messages received, uh, account length, and what else? That's about it, states. Yeah. So just uh, some enlarged data set. And now, so let's uh, turn to, let's pause this and then open up your SAS. Let's get things started. Okay, uh, I will start from fresh. If you have, you obviously, most of you have already had started the project uh, for, for telecommunication case. You can reuse the same project, uh, but there are a few things to be changed. And, or you can choose to start from fresh like I do, you know, either way. So the first thing is the project. If you have the project, open it. If you start from fresh, create a new project. Once you have the new project, you will have to first thing to create a library. It will be the same library that points to probably the same place, but for every new project, you will need a new library. Who is, uh, raise your hand if you are following. 
majority? How many? Two or three. Two or three. I'll call them. Okay. Yeah. And raise your hand if you're still not yet. Not there yet. Done? Good. Do you want us to, to wait? No. Okay. Great. Now, data source. Um, if you start from fresh, follow me. If you have already, you know, if you're using the old project, then you'll need to change a few things. Uh, I'll show you. Then uh, the next steps are for starting from fresh. Santa, any any problem? No, I I was trying to remember what I saved it as. Oh, okay. But it, it may be better to start from fresh. Okay. So to create the data source. And use your library, find the data set, confirm it, number of cases, number of variables, and then this is where things will, will be changed. Now again, this is starting from fresh, right? Okay, this window, yeah, Brian? What, what did you go to? What was the first thing you did? Uh, which part? Have you had a library yet? So we downloaded the churn, right? That's what right, we're right. To put it in a directory. Correct. And uh, wh where are you now? Do, and then what? You go to file and just select it? Uh, you can do file, create. Okay. Uh, it through, uh, are you in the project yet? Yeah, we created the project. Okay, so you have the project. You need a library first. Have you had the library first? No. Go ahead and do it. Uh, create a uh, file, create library. A file, new library, something like that. Okay. Yeah. Right? File, new. I can't. Yeah. File, new library. Library has to point to the directory where you save the data set. Do you want us to, to wait? No, 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 you're right. You sure? Yeah. Okay. Uh, Razi? You're following, right? Uh, I, I got it all quickly. So you got it, okay, great. <coughs> thank you, thank you, bro. Um, okay, now, we'll go into the advanced and customize the metadata advisor options. So what are these? You know, every time we import SAS data set, data source, SAS try to infer the role the level role is input, target, ID, you know, what have you. Levels are interval, class, dummy, or. Binary, nominal. Yeah, binary is, is, is class, a special case of class. Um, so nominal is, is class. Nom oh. Nominal is the same as oh, class. Same. Right, so SAS will try to infer. This is helpful if you have 500 variables, you know. And, but uh, here we have 21. Just to illustrate the concept, uh, be familiar with the with the features, and the way SAS infer the rows and levels can be changed. This is where we change that. So th there's two levels there. First, SAS try to infer something. You know, infer the metadata, and then now you can intercept the metadata advisory. So it, you, you change the way SAS infer the levels and roles. And it, it'll become clear in a minute. So going to select yes, and then going to uh, select the advanced, then going to customize. Now, a few things we have to do. Missing percentage threshold. That is the in terms of a particular variable, how many missing variables, how, what's the percentage of values that have to be missing before you reject, before SAS rejects the variable? 
So currently the default is 50. That means if half of the rows of that column or above half are missing, SAS will reject it without you having to do anything. If it's below 50, SAS will retain it. But you can intervene, of course. Now, this is the metadata um, sort of uh, guessing stage. Um, I would like to change it to 30 because 50, it doesn't have to be. Well, or, or 50 is just too high. I want any variable that has more than 30% missing to be rejected. So in the case if you miss that section, how do you get to that table if you already imported? You will have to start over the, in order the to data get source to that? in order to get to this point. Okay. But this point doesn't necessarily affect your variable setup. This is the guessing, sort of the intelligent part of, of, of SAS. Well, you'll see it in a minute. But for now, let's, uh, let's uh, customize these. Uh, keep every yes. The yes are saying you will use the setting that you just uh, changed. You know, the first yes is reject variable with excessive missing values. You know, that makes the 30 whatever effective. And level count. I will change it to 10. And here's why. Class levels count threshold. For a variable to be considered class variable, it has to have only a limited number of discrete labels, right? For gender, it's three labels, unknown, male, and female. For income, maybe four levels, low, medium, low, medium, high, and high. 10 tells us that if there are 10 or more different levels, it is interval. You know, for age, it makes sense that we have probably 80 different values of a large population. If it's under 10, SAS will tag it as plus. So even if, you know, even if we have, um, I don't know, customer service costs, maybe only seven unique values from zero to seven, with this setting, customer service call will be automatically selected class in, instead of interval, and then you can intervene later. Right, that makes sense? Thoughts? Yes. So that's it. And the next yes will be to make that effective. Right? So you don't have to change the yes. Excuse me, folks. I, yeah. I need a bit of your You need? I need your help. Yeah. The data source. What is that? Going further, the third number, I will change it to 100. And here's why. That number tells us if the clock, if object levels, if, uh, if a class variable has more than has a hundred or more different labels, it will tag it as rejected. And we know that there is a state, the state variable that has 51. So if you use 50, state will be rejected, and then you have to intervene. If I use it to 100, 
then um, then it will be retained, and I want to retain it. So that's why. And the next yes would be to enforce it, to 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 make the rule effective. And the last yes is to ignore it. So that's the three very important settings that save you some time in the in the next stage, in the next step. Bob. So two questions. Um, first one uh, would be the one I just on uh, uh, what you said. So you said what we set up here is the to make. You will, um, will become clear later. Very clear. Okay. So you, you can delay that question. Another question. Uh, another question is: Is it just pertaining to this yes. project this data only, data. or this data source? This data source. So if you save it uh, for the next one, you may be able to save the meta metadata advisory. But I never have to do that. Every day is sort of different. So it's different for each of yeah. Okay. I mean, I'm having issues with some basic stuff here. Okay. So you need the help. Yeah. Can yeah. yeah. okay, somebody help? Please. Uh, John. Uh, Appreciate it. Because you know, I have to copy it with the class. Okay. Now you'll be very clear next sta stage what it does. So, and after you confirm, go to the next. So, let's examine. Um, I, I selected 100 as the reject class level threshold. And state, state. Is, is is the role is nominal because it's text and it, it has to be nominal, right? And the currently it's input, so it's it's retained. If I didn't change the fifty, it will be rejected. So, you know, I save time here by doing some work earlier, right? And something else. Um, let's see. For a customer service call. It's interval because there are ten levels actually. So ten levels. If there were only seven levels, it will be it will be you know, the it will automatically select class, but you can change it later. You can change it now. So you put you put in ten earlier. I put in ten. So that would that means only less than ten, not equal ten? Equal ten, yeah. There are ten levels here. Okay. And as long as it's ten levels or more, it is interval. If it's under ten, it is class. Right? Class tend to have fewer number of levels. That makes sense, right? So I put it ten. If if I retain the twenty original default, then customer service call will be tagged class. So you know. So changing the advisory, metadata advisory, requires some knowledge about the data set from kind of business data. So what we did last time is actually helpful for today. Uh, okay, so I hope I hope that this stage, this 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 step, has answered the question that you had earlier that, that didn't uh, didn't answer. Uh, if there's remaining, let me know. So, okay, so the second number is, we put in number 10, which is anything second that less than 10, we'll put it as a class yes. variable. Yes. Anything greater than 10. Like every code, you know, every code has three unique levels. Correct, yes. It's automatically so, nominal. Right, yeah. Yeah. so I got that part. Right. And so my question for that is, so if it's right at the mark 10, would it be considered? If it's 10, and about or about it's uh, so continuous. like for that number that we said right. and about that's okay. the threshold so the threshold is included to the upper part okay and then the third number is so if it's already be con be set as a um, be considered as a class variable yes if it's have more than that number then it will be rejected yes but we set them as a number two if it's the class number it has to have less than 10, so okay. why do we set right. 100? This is a good question. So you connect the two, actually. Now, uh, state variable, even if it has 51 levels, it's right. automatically tagged as class because it's textual data. 
sexual data will never be considered an uh, interval. Okay. Yeah. So the, the number 10 does not, does not apply. Just stay. Right? That makes sense? Okay. So that for 10. Close the loop. Right? Okay. So I, I changed the, the to, to 100 so that the state variable will be retained. That makes sense. Okay. I think, go ahead. More questions? All right, now we can go next. So if you are using your old project, you want to make sure uh, you get it right. And I haven't finished yet. Uh, phone number is rejected. Why? It has more than 100 levels. And because it has more than, wait, so hold on. Phone has, has hyphen in it. So it's, it's automatically nominal first, right? And because it's nominal, it has more than 100 levels, it's rejected. And I want it to be rejected, but I don't want it to be included as input. I want it to be used as ID. So I will intervene and change it to ID. And there's another. Who can tell me there's the one thing very critical we have to do? Target. Exactly. Is that? Yeah. yeah. Good. Everybody's on on to it. So change the churn to target. And uh, carefully examine the rest. Well, um, I would tend to, because I know that area code is problematic, I would tend to reject it. But for now, we will retain it and to see the problem. So everything should be input except the churn and phone? Exactly, yeah. Okay. Yeah. And uh, to, you know, you can sort by row to clearly see the differences. You can sort by level. But later on, there's a summary page to, summary, to summarize number of different type of uh, variables to confirm that you have everything right. So go to the next. We will not configure decision processing now, but later we will. And we will not create a subsample and retain the, the raw role for the data set. And here, make sure that your summary statistics for the variables are the same as mine. Everything's good? Make sure you have at least one, one and only one target. That's the critical part. Okay, now data source is, is ready. So put that aside, we'll go back to the slides. So let's uh, refresh your minds about the variables and, and it'll allow you some time to catch up if you haven't. Um, who, who needs help? Yeah. I mean, good? Great, I'm glad. Yeah. He is just, you know, it's very good. <laughs> Enough said. Enough said. Um, all right. So uh, we'll generate some graphs. Um, from the previous graph, let's see. Uh, okay, so these two, wait. So this is just raw data set. And uh, These graphs are generated by IBM, uh, IBM, SBSS. I, not exactly another IBM something. I don't remember. Yeah, something about the book talk about it. Um, you know, IBM makes a F, IBM uh, merge with uh, or buy purchase SBSS. 
at some time. Well, IBM has model its own. Hmm? Right, 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 model one. Right, this is from model one. Um, based on, you know, using SAS, you'll have something similar, but not exactly the same, but it's fine, as long as we have those. And, and SAS probably even better in some uh, aspects. So let's, uh, let's do that. So we will try to generate a few things. One is the histogram or bar charts for the variables. And then we'll also get these summary statistics uh, from SAS EM. So uh, a node in SAS EM that's very, very helpful to get a quick snapshot of the distributions of every variable, what is it? That's okay. a good tool, not exactly. No. Still, <laughs> transform. Even though you wouldn't uh, expect, transform node allows you to interactively see the distributions without you having to make the distributions. And it's, it's focused on the distribution of that variable alone, not trying to get you, give you some insights about the relationship between the target and the uh, different inputs which are the focus of the stat explorer and graph explorer. So those try to, try to illustrate which variables are important. You know, stats explorer and graph explorer try to show you which variables are important and rank them and give you some visuals. But transform, you know, uh, show you the distribution of each of the variable independently. So you can get a sense of what, you know, how are they distributed? What are the problems with, with them alone? So that is helpful even though you wouldn't expect. So bring your SAS. And now we need to create a new diagram. Right, you can either go to, to File New Diagram or right click Diagram and Create New. And give a name. And the first thing to do is to bring the data source. That's the first thing. Now, um, so there are different approaches to lay out, to, to uh, rearrange the, the nodes here. I typically go horizontal from left to right. That's the main, main process. But you, you sometimes you have to create side process to you know, explore, to make changes, and try different things. So the first thing we'll do is the side track. We will bring up the transform nodes. It's under modify because you're making some changes to the data source. Under modify, transform is the last one. I'll put it on the side and connect the tail to the head. Now the first thing to do, if you're working with not a huge data set, the first thing to do is change the sample. You know, sample property, make sure that you see all the sample from the data set. Sorry, could you repeat the name of that again? Uh, transform. transform. So it's under modify tab, mm -hmm. the last one. Okay, thank you. Yeah. OK, make sure that transform variable node is highlighted is selected, and then the first thing to change is set sample. Sample properties, method, change it to random, and then change the size to max. So that makes sure everything is selected when you generate the graph. Isaac? If you set it to max, then does the method make a difference? Uh, what method? Where you select it. The you seed? Change it to random. Oh, the method. If, it, if it's max, no, it doesn't matter. It's weird, sometimes in other you know, properties, SAS will say just, just directly max in, inside method. So it doesn't give you a random and then you choose max, that's weird. But you know, it's a large software. So after that's selected, and we'll modify something else. Under the optional binning, I will modify replace four with 10. 
So what does this do? Um, to graph an interval variable that has row interval, uh, you would have to use histogram to show the distribution. You have to make some arbitrary you know, bars. And the bar with it, the range of each bar is, is selected based on some rule, right? You can specify the range of each bar and have, have, has, have as, as many columns as needed, or you can specify number of columns and divide them by that number to include in each bar. Here, I'm using 10 instead of four because I, I, I want to see more bars. I want to see a more detailed distribution rather than only four bars is a more crude distribution of the uh, interval variable. Make sense? Yeah. So then after this, you will see for every histogram, there are 10 bars. Um, that's done. And then make sure you run. And we won't to we won't go into see the results because there are not much to see. No, we haven't changed anything to the variable yet. But instead, we will use the formula to exploit the tool. How nice is it? And there are a few dividers here. It's not very obvious, so you know, just make your way and uh, feel it. <laughs> and for the, for the inputs, you really don't need a large area for that. Oh, make sure you're, you select the transform node on the sidebar, the property pane. Look for formula, formulas. Okay. Click the eclipse. Let me know when you get there. Daniel? Yeah. Okay. Good, great. So, you know, rearrange the sides of the windows a little bit. You actually, you need to see the data set. Down there, click the sample to show the sample. And then, you know, don't make it too small. You still need to see it. Inputs, you don't really have to see the inputs. And here is a variable selection pane, and this is the uh, distribution pane. Okay, let's go one by one. Uh, account length. It has a nice distribution. It has a, r a very wide range. It has between 1 and 243. You know, assuming this is number of days, maybe. So th there, are, there are people who have been with the company just one day, two days up to 200 days, you know, more than half a year. Um, this may be maybe months, I don't know exactly. But uh, the specific unit may not be as critical to data analysts if you're ba building a model. But if, you, if you're making presentation, you better be sure you know the unit because you know, the boss will ask you and if you say something stupid, that's not good. <laughs> that that, that you know, damage your credibility, which actually is not related. So 13 seats will have to be right. Um, Okay, now you notice there are 10, 10 bars. That's because we changed it to 10. If we leave the default, you will see only four bars. Right? And you have the option to make more bars if you want. Okay, um, let's see. Now before I go into the detail, I'll put it aside. If you look at the other options here under drawing, 
we use the formulas. There's one option as variables. Every node has a variable option. And the variable is to customize what variables you want to include and exclude from this point on, right? And we don't need to do any of change that, so, so I don't use it. Um, the interactions here. The interactions here is, don't mistake it with interactive exploration. It's not interactive tool. It is for creating interaction. Are you familiar with the interaction terms in regression? When you, when you, when you mul multiply two variables together, it creates an interaction variable that provides additional uh, sort of a source of variation to explain the, the, the uh, target variable. It's somewhat like a curvilinear, you know, additional curvilinear term to make the model more complex to explain nonlinear relationships. Right. So we probably never ever use that here. And SAS code, there's a uh, SAS code, how, how nice. You can program here by using SAS code. But we'll, we'll not use uh, too much of that. Okay, go back to graph. So this is great. Um, now, account length may be related to turn to churn. Uh, you know, from a business sense, those who stay longer tend to stay longer, just because they don't have any problem. You know, those who have problem early on, they tend to, you know, get out soon. So this might be, you know a hypothesis to be tested. And we can do that, right? So, you know, by looking at the graph, it's normally distributed. It's quite, you know, behave, behave quite well. So I don't, sus I don't suspect the data has problem on this variable. Okay, now area code. That's interesting. Um, First thing you notice, the values of area code are numbers. But because there are only three levels, SAS you know, uh, chose the, the level as categorical or nominal because of the, the number 10 we said. Anything below 10 is automatically selected as nominal. right? But because it's numbers, there are a gap in it when, when SAS makes a graph. <laughs> You want the SAS to be more intelligent, but you just can't get there. So the nicest way is to just have three bars connected to each other without any gap. But this is awkward. You know, it won't get you fired, but <laughs> it will make you be criticized. So what do you do? There's actually options to change that. So in every graph, what you can do is, is this. Right click, graph properties. Now, this window is intense. Tons of things you can do here. Let me just show you some ways. And uh, you, I just found out you cannot enlarge it. But anyway, we'll work with that. Okay, the, that thing I talked about to, to, to eliminate space between the bars or under um, this scale, I think, uh, under, let's see. Where is it? Oh, yeah. Scaled spacing. So you want to get rid of that. And without clicking OK, you can click Apply. And it just uh, applies. You know? Uh, so that three bars is, is nicer, it's clearer. So there are only three discrete levels of area codes. And by the law of telecommunication industry, you have different area codes every geographic area. A state may, only, may, may, may even have more than one area code 
a city may even have more, typically one, but you have sometimes more than one. And now we have an entire nation. If you if you have looked at the uh, states distributions, fifty one states or uh, regions are represented, but we only have three area codes. What does that tell you? Some big problem, big problem. So you know, I will not trust this variable. Um, now, we go to the next. We look at the turn. But if you quickly turn back, it goes back. So everything you changed will not be saved. Uh, so if you're doing the homework, make sure you, you know, take the screenshot so that you don't have to do it again. But doing it is, is easy. It just takes some, a little bit uh, more time. Now, uh, churn is a target variable. So from this graph, you kind of get a notion of uh, the uh, the, the percentage of turners versus non-turners. You, know, you have only maybe one to the ninth, or one to the seventh, or one to the eighth of people who churned uh, last month, and uh, the rest of them didn't churn. So this is the critical sort of piece of uh, information that will help you train the model, you know, give you the feedback that who are those who churned, and what characteristics do they possess on the other input variables to train the model. The next one is uh, customer service calls. Uh, you confirm the, re, uh, the range. It goes from zero to up to nine. It's right tail skewed, it's right skewed. It has a, a good concentration of zero customer service calls, but somewhere around one, you know, around uh, between 0.9 and 1.8, because we know that the numbers are integers, so it can only be one. So the mode is one. Most, uh, most customers made one customer service call. And then it goes down again uh, if you increase the number. Uh, if you want to make this graph look better, you need to make a few adjustments in, in terms of how many bars to have, right? Uh, but you, you want to, best case scenario is you want to have each bar represent one number, right? So zero number, one number, two number, up to the maximum. But then you need to know what is the maximum in order to calculate. From this graph, it doesn't look like there is a nine, so but the graph made it, it must be there. So what is happening? Um, using the connected, you know, linked graph and uh, 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 sort of tables, you can, you can pinpoint to those points. So you can either click here, but it's hard to click. There's nothing to click here. There is something, but it's hard to see. So the other thing you can do is brush. So brush this, this way, it's selected. And if you go down here to look for the customer service call and to, to rank it inversely, you will see that two customers made nine customer service calls, right? There are two. So it's up to nine. And the number is just uh, around the sequence. There's, there's no gap between them, so there are 10 numbers. But 10 numbers doesn't make, uh, it's 10 numbers. 10, but I have 10 bars, but 10 bars didn't make it uh, uh, good. So it's there's something about the inclusive exclusive range. Uh, I can try decrease one bar to see. How did you do the whole brush thing? Okay, right click, uh, right -click to make sure it's brush. And then, and then you just brush. Uh, you When you brush, you, you hold down the left key. Oh. And then, you know, in, in, in the data set, you have to rank it properly to see those. And those are grayed out or lightened out are the selected values. Now, to, to go back to, to change the number of bars, right click, same place, graph properties. And then it's about bin. 
and then I change to 9 and see what happens. See? Um, what happens is somehow the values are included. Two values are included one in one bar. That makes the, the graph nicer. But, you know, it's just uh, a little bit nicer. So you had diff different options to do. Um, actually, let me dem demonstrate something else. In account length, you know, if I'm interested in seeing the headers in within this range, but I want to zoom in, I can do that. You know, you notice the hand lens when you hover over the axis, right? And you hold down the left key and then drag to the right, it zooms in. And then you have a bar to navigate. So you can do that. You have the option. If you are, you know, if you had enough about the zoom in and you want to go back, right click, action, reset. It resets the zoomed in. Everyone's good? Okay, now from the next uh, variable, it'll be very similar, uh, but I'll quickly run through the the different cause, minutes, and charge, and you know have a have a quick impression of what's going on. Ready? Go. This is day call, day charge, day mean. I changed, but it it it. It uh, seldom changed. It didn't change. You know, almost didn't change when I go back and forth. And evening call, evening charge, minute, charge, minute, charge, minute, same thing. Similar, similar distribution, but different ranges if you see. You know, charge is dollars. It can't be too much in the range of 10, 20s, but, but uh, minutes are hundreds. And international calls, this is how things are different. International calls are skewed because few people make a lot of international calls, right? And there are a, a few zeros. But international charge is more normally distributed. And charge and minute, same distribution, similar. And when I go to the night calls, night minute, night charge, night minute. So across these different, you know, c different segments of the day, between charge, minute, and cause, which are, I'm not talking about segments, I'm talking about the three type. Which two are identical, ident identically distributed? Charge. So what do you infer from that? Fixed. Fixed rate. Yeah. Linear rate. You use more, you pay more. You know, like going to the supermarket. There's <laughs> no change. Uh, so that's true for day, night, and evening. And for international calls, the same. Yeah, it's basically the same. So even with international plan, 
its linear rate. You see where the problem is? You want to reward those who use a lot. And you earn more. And maybe, hopefully, the, the, the marginal cost to you is not as, you know, it, it also diminishes if you use more. So this might be a you know, hy hypothetical case, but this gives you an area to improve and make the proposals. And the last one, we focus, uh, before that, state. There are 51 states. 51 states and in capital included. And it's fairly, you know, uniformly distributed, spread out, spread out. So either the state has, has a problem, or the area code has a problem, or both, right? You, you got that right in the homework. Uh, the last one, a voicemail plan. The majority of them do not have voicemail plan. A minority, maybe one to the fifth, have voicemail plan. And only for those who have voicemail plan will have ever received any voicemail message. Right? That's that's the internal logic. And the distribution for because majority of them do not have the voicemail plan, the majority of them have zero uh, voicemail messages. And for those who have, it's it's even it's it's not it's symmetrically distributed. And this is how, you know, you can make it, oh, I just realized, you can, you can not only zoom on the x-axis, you can zoom on the y-axis as well. So that, you know, you can, you can avoid being affected by the, the big hike, spike, and then you can see the granular shapes of that distribution. There's a person who gets two messages per day. Uses a lot. <laughs> um, yeah. Question: When you zoom in enough, like yeah. when you zoom in more, yeah, in the first bar, there's like it, it goes up. The, no, like does it, it has something like this? I don't know what it implies. Oh, uh, because uh, it, I think that some cases are selected. And this is a linked graph. These cases, a few cases, are being selected. You can, you can, uh, you can, you know, reset it. Oh, I see. Because it's selected. A subset of the data set is selected, and that happens to me as well. You see, it's nice. I have these two customers selected. They have they made nine customer service calls. They have zero voice messages. They, they're not using that service. One has uh, one one and the yeah, other like has few. Yeah. So it gives you the extreme cases. Now so remember everything we did to change the you know, zoom in, to change the shape, to change the bars are not saved. But make sure you know how to get there, you know, again, if you want. And uh, actually, I can do this. I want to show one bar for each value. So there you go. It's, uh, it's still symmetrically distribute but more spread out because yeah, how did you do one bar for each uh, you s just to you determine first you have to decide how many bars you need mm -hmm. and then go into graph graph uh, properties mm -hmm. and change the beans to 51 um. yeah so that's it
So this, uh, you know, oh, some uh, we we got the graphs. We know all the graphs, right? We haven't got the uh, these statistics. So to do that, you you you'll use Stat Explorer. So close the uh, transform, and then go to Explore. The Stat Explorer is the third to the right to the right. Well, I'll put it here because Stat, Stat Explorer is one of the main uh, paths typically. Uh, again, check the sample properties. And this time it's different. Razi, you see? It's a number of observations, uh, 10,000, 100,000 chosen. So it's more than what we need. So it will include everything. Or alternatively, you can say all. You know, so the design kind of fluctuates between the different nodes. And also, Wait, make sure Stat Explorer selected. I also want interval variables to be included in chi-square statistics. So change to, to yes. And for interval variables, I also choose number of beans to, to 10 instead of five. should be it. So run it. Daniel? I was just curious, why did you do Stat Explorer as like a different direction than say like connecting it to the transform variable? Um, because that's just their convention and personal style. Would it, it, would it, it affect the run if say it was all just one horizontal line? Um, when you run, no. So when you run, you select the path, uh, the end point of the path. It will only run that path that leads to the end point. I'll demonstrate. So creating the two different It's fine. doesn't really affect It's independent, it. yes. So if I say run this, right, it will only run the churn data source and then Stat Explorer, it will leave that alone. If I run that path, it will leave this path alone. So that's, uh, that's the way it works. So you can have multiple paths. Does that, does that help if you have to have like a large data set? Large project. Like large the li li large yeah. project, basically. Because you explore different ways, different areas, and sometimes you go back and explore more. So you create a side track. It doesn't affect the main track, right? You know, uh, I assure you, when you do the project in three months, your your diagram will look like a spider, <laughs> spider net, by the way. I assure you, you'll have more than 20, 25, 30 nodes on it. So you'll have multiple paths. Well, the cricket says, need a break? We'll take a break. We'll come back uh, 32. Well, uh, let me clear individual questions if you have. Okay, let's uh, let's come back and uh, get it started again. Now, uh, what's interesting is uh, just right before class, uh, I I accidentally poured water onto my mat. It's just, it's almost like half cup. Oh my God. It's just water, or just water, just water. So it's better than coffee. So I was worried, you know, anytime, anytime it can break down. But it 
it's just holding very well. So what I do, I didn't turn it off. I just flip over as the water drips, and then I, I clean it with a with a towel. And then there was standing water on it because I couldn't I couldn't push very hard. You know, I I, I was worried. And water <coughs> definitely went into the keyboard, but it may go into the chip. So I I'm I'm a relatively new Mac user. I'm not that familiar. And I managed to 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 break the Mac system and I couldn't diagnose. You know, I'm so good at diagnosing Windows but not Mac. Like I, I gave the IT to work on it, they just to sort of restore the uh, restore the system and work. So, but still, heads up, you know, it can break down any time. Let's just hope it doesn't. Okay, let's get back to um, to it. Well, I'll quickly show the slides. Um, so, so far we have done no, we haven't haven't seen the stats yet. So once you have the Stat Explorer run, go into the results. Now, and this you should be familiar with this, because uh, in homework one uh, there was a question about missing values, right? And uh, you must have used this to find the missing values, and there's not, there's no missing values in this data set. It doesn't mean the data set is no problem. You have, you know, we have already seeing a few variables that have a uh, probable one, very likely. Uh, here you have, you have all the, uh, you know, summary statistics for all the variables broken down by target input and broken down by interval variables versus class variables. Class is equivalent to nominal. Dummy variable is a special case. We will revisit this table, so just have it uh, minimized and put it aside. Okay, so now it's nice to see the this summary this summary this uh, stats about the variables, but uh, the the ultimate uh, goal of uh, exploratory analysis is to help inform the model building, right? So you want to know which variables are informative about the target variables and which are not. So it's better to see at the, the relationships as the next step. Right? After you have known more about each of the individual inputs, now you, you will proceed with getting insights about preliminary uh, information about which are the variables that are more predictive about the target than others. So it would be nice to have uh, correlation analysis between each of the input with the target. How do you do that? Uh, correlation statistic is one thing, but you don't see you don't see a graph. You only see the number, right? Um, so, and, but uh, seeing the graph is is is, is good. is important, and you can present those to the boss. Yeah, and you just present. It. These are the correlations, if you do this. These are the correlations, go figure. You know, they are very clear. Th these variables have high correlation, go figure. He will be mad, or she will be mad. Um, so it's nice to show some nice graph. Uh, so you need to know how to do it in tasks. Luckily, there's a quick way to generate all the graph that you need in one shot between the target and every of the input. Let's try. And so this is not covered in the book or the slides. This is unique to SAS. So, so you want to follow along and, and um, know how to do it. All right. The, the tool that we'll use is multiplot. So go ahead and find the multiplot. It's under explore. And you, you feel free to connect it with transform. So it's, it's uh, continuing the sidetrack. Uh, to show you exactly where it is under explore multiplot is uh, is an icon with uh, a few you know lines in it go ahead 
drag under and connect with the transform. And again, as with any exploratory tool, you modify the sample property first, right? Well, actually, you don't. You don't need. This just takes all. Yeah, mix that. Sorry. So you don't need to uh, re-specify the sam the s the sides to be included. Uh, okay. Now uh, observe the options that are selected. Type of charts: bar charts versus scatter plot, or both. No, what are they? Um, this multiplot makes all the possible plots between the target and every input variable. Right? Typically, when you try to examine and use graph to show correlation between two variables, you typically use scatter plot. Yeah, we can see it clearly, the, you know, the, the, the linear shape or nonlinear shape. So let's try if we use the scatter plot, but be cognizant that um, the target variable is a dummy variable. The target is yes or no, true or false. So it will show up on the graph like two lines, but scattered across the x value, whatever the x value is. Right? So we'll, we'll get a sense of what that means. So modify that into scatter plot. And so for the bar part, for the bar chart options are grayed out because it's not selected. And for the, we can choose to, to, to show the regression equation. And we decide to use a simple linear regression model to modify, to, uh, to explore the relationships. Uh, run it. And now we need to see the results. There are two parts. One is the summary results, which has nothing. Well, has some uh, um, variable summary statistics, which are the same as with the stat explore. And then the graph. We will focus on this part, so enlarge it. And down here, it's the every uh, pair between the, the, the target and the every input, right? So as I said, it will be two lines, two lines, one for true and one for false of the, the turn. And depending on the, the, the uh, level of the input, it will be either continuous lines or you know, dots. So for account length, it's like that. Do you, what do you make of it? Not much. Useless. Close to useless. <laughs> At least there are dots, <laughs> you know. <laughs> um, yeah, close to useless. And uh, you know, you can do when when you're presenting, you can make that automatic. You can use you know slideshow sort of, and then you can customize the speed of the you know slides. But we're not using it. So we go to the next. Ooh, this is sexy. Six dots. <laughs> you know, more useless maybe. Um, yeah. So, but are there uh, are they really like six dots, six points, six uh, observations? Three they are all piled up. If there's a height dimension, you will see you know, a high high bars of the six bars. But it'll be it'll be it'll be useful to see the height of the ball. It'll be a three D, three uh, D graph. But three you know, D graph is not easy. Three you know, D is okay. Four D is just too much. Um, so you know, SAS is not good for three, but for this, for the scatter plot with with the categorical target variable, because you have this problem uh, in R. Uh, you, if you are familiar with R, uh, or uh, let me tell you, in R programming, R is made for data analysis and Python for some packages. There's one type of 
plot, which is jitter plot. What does that mean? It creates some randomness to the x and y. So it uh, shifts randomly the points to a little bit to the left, right, up, down, and all around. So what's the result? If there are more dots here, it'll be more spread out. It'll be more concentrated. You, you can see the many, many dots you know, randomly scattered around this point. But if there are only a few points, you will only see a few points. So by that, you have another dimension put into the 2D graph to show you know, some more information. And that's the beauty of the open source program, that you have more tools. Um, here it's not. But, oh, sassy. <laughs> more dots. Anyway, so the conclusion is, is this uh, scatter plot useful? Not very much. And the reason is the target variable is categorical. Yeah, you cannot use. So we'll switch to the other other uh, type. Now make sure multiply is selected. We'll choose the bar chart. And now we know that the both will not be useful. You know, so bar chart may be useful. Uh, and then we have more uh, options. For bar chart, let's choose. So numeric threshold. This is another sort of a metadata treatment, but this is for making the multiply. I will modify it 20 to 15. So that if, if a variable has 18 levels uh, and it's numeric, I want to request SAS to treat it as interval. So I lower the threshold and have more variables treated as interval than class, right? Because I want to show the inter uh, binned uh, distributions of the inter interval variables. Okay, that's the only thing. Or you can choose uh, vertical or horizontal. Uh, better use horizontal to be same as the uh, as as the book. So change it to horizontal and rerun it. on the graph. Please raise your hand if you are here. Everybody? Is it what what's funny? I'm sorry. Anyway. <laughs> Something else is funny. But uh, uh, th this is useful. You know, this is the kind of this is the graph that we that you made uh, last week, isn't it? This is how you make it, and you make it in batch. You just have everything created for you, you know, without having to click many many times. Uh, okay, so a notion, a business notion that I, you know, sort of, uh, um, I said was uh, the longer. A customer stayed with the with the company. The, the less likely that this account will be terminating. You know, by reading the graph, it rejects basically rejects the notion because there isn't much of a difference proportion-wise. Proportion of turners or red part. Proportion of turners are evenly distributed across different account maps. Does that make sense? Yeah. And you have the percentage calculated for you. On the extremes, it's very little. So extremes are always extremes. You know, you have to, to, to look at them differently. 
but there are so little numbers you, you cannot extrapolate the pattern. So we will not focus too much on the extremes where there are just a dozen cases. We'll ignore those for now. We look at the overall patterns. It starts from small. When when the account is short, you know, the, the account length is short, they typically are within their contract and it'll be dumb to just terminate it to, to incur some, you know, fees, uh, penalty. I think that's why the percentages are low. And going up, it's fairly, fairly okay, fairly uh, similar. And then if you enlarge it, increase it, it also decreases, but not that dramatically. Overall, it, there's no definitive um, clear pattern. It just uh, changes gradually. Right. Um, yeah. So that's what we read. Um, but uh, there are some differences. So maybe I want to include it in the modeling phase to let the model decide if the variable is important. I'll go to the next. Oh. So what is this? Area code. I think uh, I, I think I misread the, the percentages. The percentages are talking about the entire bond, not the portion of the red. So previously, the proportion of the red should be very uniform. It's only the entire length of the bond is different in terms of percentages. So here, there's a dramatic difference. It doesn't mean the proportion is dramatically different. The proportion of churners should be very uniform across the three area codes. And it confirms another notion that uh, area codes might be randomly generated. Just uh, random. You know, so it doesn't have any relationship with any other variable whatsoever. And customer service calls, you know, as uh, consistent with the conclusion from last week. Customer service calls, when it goes up to four and above, the percentage of churning approaches and uh, goes beyond 50%. Uh, as versus when it's below four, like three to one or zero. It's all minor, one to the fifth, one to the sixth. So a turning point maybe for customer service calls. And some groups uh, recommend it to, to track number of, number of customer service calls and raise an arm if it's three or four. That makes sense. And this is consistent uh, with that notion. You can jump between the different graphs by going to this uh, drop, down, drop up menu. Uh, something else I want to show you. Now, uh, the, the minutes and the charge are linearly related. The more minutes you, 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 you use, the more charges you are incurred, right? That doesn't mean the number of calls are very closely related. You can make more calls, but still every call is very short, so the number of minutes still don't go up that much, and the charge won't go down much up. And uh, the, so this may create the situation where the relationship between charge and churn is different from the relationship between cause and churn. That might be different. So let's uh, confirm it. And this is day cause. So we focus on the percentage of red of each bar going from the top to the bottom and uh, with not with avoid using this percentage to, to to interpret the percentage of red it's not it's the percentage of the entire bar of the entire data set so we have to just have to visually you know measure it um, and uh, maybe best way to compare is 
you know, you have the center, and you, you compare the symmetric uh, positions uh, going away from the center. So these two may be comparable. This is slightly different, but this is longer, so it's not actually very much. And these two are comparable, these two comparable, comparable along the way. So they are, there's no pattern to me. And so that's number of calls that one make during the daytime, right, uh, of a month probably, and then its relationship with churn. There's no, there's not much uh, relationship that can be detected from the graph. Going to the next day charge. Now, minute and charge are different. If charge is decided by minute, the cause, cause, sorry, cause and charge are different. Charge is de decided by minute, and uh, this is charge. It's not symmetric, if you see. If you go up to a, a large number of charge, up to the 46 and $50, it's clearly the majority of them turn, right? As versus those who are making, who are paying $10 uh, a month, or $15 a month, Little of them churn. So that makes a lot of difference. Using this graph, you can detect the correlation. And even though number of you know, charge and number of calls may seem to be similar from a business notion, data may tell you something different. Right? That's how you discover you know, sort of insights from, from the data set. And what do you think the you know, the pattern will be for minutes. Same, Same with the... Same with the day charge. Yeah, let's see. Confirmed. It's non-symmetric. When you go up to, to hundreds of minutes, per proportion of churn goes up because they are related, you know, because they are linearly related. You know, how do you expect otherwise? Um, and the same pattern goes for, th does the same pattern go for evening calls and evening charge, do you think? Yes, they do. Let's see. So evening calls, still calls are not making any difference, right? Evening charge, that's evening charge. Is that, is that confirming the notion or disconfirming the notion? Is it symmetric? Is it non symmetric? Is going is 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 it you know more churning when charges go up? Not exactly. So this is evening charge. And evening charge does not make people churn more. Interesting, right? And night charge even in minutes, same thing. It's not very highly correlated with churn. An international call is different. Let's get, skip that for now. Uh, night calls. Night calls are not related because it's symmetric. Night charge, same thing, not related. Right? So it seems only the day calls. No, the day minute and day charge is related. Can you think of one? Maybe the business user. And cost wise, it's just more of a burden for them to like to pay a fixed rate comparing to paying like in kind of like a data plan or like a call plan. Sure. Can you elaborate? So right now, for example, like most of data plans have like unlimited calls, but for yeah, example, no, if this is not, like it's data it's plans, right. you you pay non-linear rate if you use more. Like if you use one gigs, it can be like fifteen bucks, but if you use that's like data, five gigs, it's plan. like twenty bucks. Yeah, that, like, that's a uh, like data plan. Yeah, that's meta uh, metaphorically the same. Yeah, I know. Yeah, um, if those people who are making a lot of calls and these people, 
have to make calls in the, in the daytime. They, there's there's no option probably for these people to shift the time of call. Probably because they are business people. How can you call people at 10, 10, 10 o'clock in the night to probably save save money? Maybe. You know, even though we know that for any segment of the day, the rate is fixed, right? Because the more minutes you call, the more charge. Yeah. But different segments may have different price levels. The fixed rate might be different yeah. across the segments, right? Rationally, night minutes should charge should uh, be less expensive because less people are using it. You know, the, the telecommunication company are bearing less uh, burden of the infrastructure. They can, you know, people, if people call at night, they could be calling anytime at night. It's more distributed. And fewer people may call at night anyway, right? So they have less burden. Uh, so that's why typically, you know, from at least from 15 years ago, 20 years ago, your plan will have uh, weekends uh, as free weekdays as counting toward the quota that you purchase, that you pay for. And nine minutes are also free. And then later it started, everything's free. Because they are better able to handle the cost. Right? And uh, because of uh, competition. Yeah. These things go together. So, these business people are angry. They have to make calls in the day and they are not getting a better rate because uh, they because they, they use more. When they compare this business this plan with other companies, they're more likely to churn. Probably that's the story. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's Do you half see price. any others? It's half price if you call in the evening. Ah, uh, you have already confirmed it. Yeah. So you you made, you made a cal calculation. Yeah. Based on the graph. Yeah. So that's the way you you drill down. This is drill down. SAS didn't tell you. You have to think about it, compare graphs, and you know pursue pursue the the logic. So that's what we learned. But as you learn more, things could change. And that's what happens. Um, soon, soon you, you will find out. Okay, and one last thing uh, is international one, two things. With the international plan, right? It's the majority of them don't have international plan. And from previous week, we know that international plan tend up to be a good thing for this business. When, you know, for those who have international plan, they tend to turn more. So we can confirm here, almost 40% of the shoulder ball churn, but close to 15% you know, of the longer ball churn. So depending on whether or not the, the household has international plan, the churn rate is dramatically different, right? So this becomes an important variable to consider in the model. And and one last thing is, and okay, so if international plan makes a difference, then should international cause or charge also make a difference? It should. If that's the if that's the reason, you know, international call service is not very good. So th those who make a lot of calls tend to turn more. That's the hypothesis. And then we can quickly confirm it. International minutes still not very effective. Uh, minutes, wait, minutes should be use, it should be effective because it's related to charge. Calls are not making a difference. Charge 
It's not very related. So what what's going on? When you look at the calls, it looked like there was a make a few calls. The churn. So it's uh, yeah. The calls are no. The calls are not non symmetric. They are skewed. It's different from the other calls. The 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 day call, night calls, evening calls. They are more normal. International calls are just are, are skewed. Right. Fewer people make more international calls, and more people are making fewer international calls. But the charge distribution is more normal. That means the charge, the rate is different. Wait the minute now. Skip the minutes. We should be comparing minute and charge. They are the same. Okay. No, sorry. Yeah. Uh, so the cause and minutes are not corresponding with each other. Uh, anyway, so international charge is not very important, but having the plan alone makes quite a bit of difference. This may be because it's a smaller sample, right? Those who make uh, internet, those who have international plan, is a minority of the entire sample. So we can see weird uh, correlation between different variables. And one last thing is the the message and the voicemail message uh, correlation with with the uh, churn is opposite, right? The percentage of churning is reduced for the shorter volume. It's much reduced. So percentage of churners. <coughs> among those who have voicemail plan, um, it's less. So, so those who have voicemail plan is happier than those who do not have uh, voicemail plan, although the, the non-voicemail plan is the majority. Right? And so pursuing this, would you expect that those who have more voicemail messages tend to be happier and, and turning less? Let's see. Yeah, I think that's right. So those who, in, in these bars, although you know, it'd be nice if we can uh, enlarge it, zoom in, but you can only do it, do this in graph in graph export. Uh, not here. Uh, graph. Oh, you mean like a formula in the transform variable now? Is that graph export earlier? Transform, yeah. 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 It, uh, you can do that in transform. Window, but not here. You cannot change the, the graph property too much. But if you enlarge it, if you, if you zoom in, the percentage of churners are very little in these bars, and it's certainly not comparable. If even if you you know compress it to this this uh, this long, one fifth one fifth of the bar will be red. So it's, it's still more than any of these bars. So if, so this is correlated. You know. Voice, voicemail plan and voicemail message are similarly related to churn, different from the international plan and international minutes. But anyway, the, the, the lesson learned are that the two dummy variables, the two plan variables, are both important. And uh, you don't want to exclude them from, uh, from, from the further modeling phase. Okay, so this is multiplot. It's efficient, it gives you a lot of great graph, but you can't zoom in. Can't zoom in too much. So we'll move on to different tools. Uh, <coughs> for now, I'll go back to the slides and to illustrate a few examples. So, <coughs> uh, to make graphs, um, to make uh, correlational graphs, this is not. This is exploring the categorical variables on the top. So these graphs you can make in uh, transform, right? So seeing the distribution of true and false on churn, 
You can get it in transform. You can also get it in every other explore node or explore tool. Um, so this shows you 85% of the uh, sample did not churn and 15% churned. And you can both see the count and percentage. It would be nice to be able to generate that graph in SAS. This is, uh, this is no, this is IBM modeler. So let's do it in SAS. So uh, for multiplot, I'll just uh, minimize it and go back to the uh, EM window. So now. Uh, I will look at the, uh, I'll, I'll generate custom plots between input and uh, target, but based on the specific inputs, right? And be able to customize the graph options. So for that, you will need graph explore. So it's under explore again, graph explore. is the fourth one from the left. I will put it behind Stat Explorer just because it's, you know, one of the exploratory tool. And make sure, again, it's a graphing tool, so make sure you choose the entire sample. So under sample properties, you choose random and then choose max. Same thing, same thing. And make sure you run it. Go to results. Okay, uh, who's uh, who's following along? Who who need more time? Raise your hand if you need more time to get here. Yeah, everybody. Great. So that's the that's the churn. So it gives you by default the distribution of the target variable, and it's 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 bars. It's vertical bars instead of uh, horizontal bars but I'll show you how to make things, right? So, now you see that to make th this graph, we, sh we, we need to have it vertical, uh, horizontal instead of vertical. We need to see the counts, we need to see the percentages, and then some you know labels and legends. So I'll do it slowly, but uh, you know, follow along. You will need to generate a new plot. So click the plot first. Anywhere, click the plot. Go to view plot. Now you have an option to select different different plots for. For, for nominal variables, to make the bars, you use the bar chart. And make sure you select the horizontal, because that's what we want. And now, this is critical, because this is uh, where confusion uh, you know, come along. Uh, and it tends to differ by different kinds of plots. So it, it, it just differs. So just have to learn case by case, or type of graphs, case by case. Um, we are making a uh, bar chart of turn, and that's the only thing we're making. And so the, the, the two bars are considered, in bar chart term, they are considered a uh, category. So we are using turn. We're assigning the category role for turn.
And for now, accept the default, we get the frequency. So this row is totally different from the row that we set in the data source, right? It's different, yeah. It's only for the graphing. And then, you know, you can edit now, you can add the title. Some of the, some of the things will be generated automatically, so we can change it later. So leave them alone, and so you have this. You have a new graph, which is horizontal bar, uh, but it's very small. I'll show you, and, and there are you know, many, many windows here. So can I better arrange it? Maybe you can, you, know, you can do it manually. There's a trick here. If you see very closely, if you minimize this window by having all the graph and tables uh, there, but they are overlapped for now, minimize this window, and then get it back. See what happened? It rearranges the, the, the tables to very you know, nicely. And, but you know, it, what's annoying is if you minimize again, or if you move something and minimize again and turn it back, this graph may go there, or may go here, or may go there. That's a random process. So you can't just, you, you know, if, if you scratch your head for that, I, I can't help. It's just a sad thing. So this is a graph that we made. Um, we want to change it, make it nicer. So uh, I want to use different colors for different uh, values. I want to add more legends. I want to add the, the label, the, the, the result, the values, count values. So here's what you do. Go to graph, properties, and you can do a lot of things here. I want to color by category. You know, as you change, you can apply to see the effect. So you already see that different colors are applied. I want to show labels. So the counts are up there. For axes, um, I want to, for the horizontal, I, it's already, it's already done, done. If you want to, wait, yeah, for vertical, if you want to true to be downstairs, to sort of, you know, to switch the places, you can do reverse. So they're switched. And then I want to show title. So the title, and then you can customize the title. And finally, for legend, I want to show the legend. I want to show the legend inside the graph areas. And I decide which part of the graph. There are eight options to go. Southeast would be the area you know that's, that's blank. So I want to put it there. And show the title of the legend to say, you know, two categories of turn. And with everything selected to apply, you have this legend, you know, the name of the legend, the variable that's uh, related to the legend, and the two levels of the legend, and the color codes. So that's all. You know, once you replace, once you replace the title, it will be a very good one. And, uh, Okay, so this gets us the count, but there's no percentage, right? How to get the percentage? I'll just show you in this graph to modify this gra graph. You can alternatively create a different graph with everything else being the same, but something, one thing being different. I'll modify here. I'll change the count to percentage. Right click and go to data options. Down here, it's a drop down menu. Instead of selecting frequency, you choose percentage. And you already see the effect. 
So we can do either or, not both? Not both. Uh, but what you can do is make another plot and then choose differently for the both plots. Yeah. So you can do the same plot twice? And of course, you can, you can do whatever. Every plot is, even if it's a duplicate, it can be done. And every plot is connected. So if you have two identical plots, you click one bar, the other bar, that, that same bar in the other plot will be highlighted, right? So you have a lot of options here. Okay, so this makes the uh, almost, almost exactly, but not the same uh, as with the, the slides. Now, uh, now next step is to analyze the relationship between particular categorical variable with the churn. So to have something like this. Right? This is same as the multi-plot result, but where you can customize the, um, you know, the graph options. Right? So how to do it. Uh, go, in, go back to the graph window and just simply make more graphs. For now, I will minimize the table and the summary results that just to make more room. So what we want is, going back, what we want is a, first it's a bar chart of yes and no international plan. So what it all goes to the, con or all goes to the two bars. It's the international plan will be assigned category. But we also have an overlay of uh, churn on uh, the target variable. So that's different color codes within each bar. That will have the role of group. So category and group, two, di two different things. So now I'll create a, a new plot. A new clone is this? I don't think so. Yeah. So for here, uh, churn is group. You know, make sure it's group. And then international plan is category. And, you know, Frequency or percentage, you, you name it. I'll use percentage. And again, minimize and then maximize. So that bar goes to the, the upper left for me. For this one? Um, plot and go to bar plot, right? And then in the in the list of variables, you will choose, for churn, you will choose group. For international plan, you will choose category. Mm -hmm. And then you select the percentage or frequency. Then you will get, get this one. Let me know if you got it. So that's that's basically you know that looks uh, very similar to this although you have the two bars flipped flipped to uh, pos position and you know how to do it and as normal I will you know create a few things it's already color coded so I don't have to choose it um, I will choose show labels and currently the groups under each bar is are, are stacked. You know they are stacked. You can have an, another option, which I'll show you later. You can you can experiment with that as well uh, by showing the labels. Because I chose the percentage, I will see the percentage of the entire bar, right? International uh, account holder, uh, international plan uh, purchasers uh, take about ten percent. 
of the entire sample for the vertical uh, vertical legends I'll have it uh, reversed so they're reversed for the horizontal nothing has to be changed for the group I will show the legend same thing and show the title of the legend and basically okay right so that is almost exactly the same as this graph in in the book so we cannot do the featured shoe first like the red one at the bottom of the bar yeah what do you mean so right now it's like it turn false and then turn shoe as a as the top of the, the bar can we do a reverse of that Oh, do you mean the, the tip of the box? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can reverse the horizontal axis. Yeah, do it for a second. Try it. Does it work? It looks like this. Oh, you have the facing other side. Oh, okay. Just reverse. Yeah, just the like more. Yeah. the whole thing to the right instead yeah, of like these values. You know, it's made this way maybe because that's the minority. The minority is on the top, so that makes it clear. Otherwise, it's kind of upside down, if you will. Yeah. So that's international plan overlay. And if you don't want them to be stacked, and but you want them to, s to be side by side, you can do that. And you have another benefit of doing that. Right now, it only show uh, the percentage or count of each ball. But if you put them side by side, which is the cluster, you can show the percentage of every ball. So you can see two more percentages. Right. So you s you go to the same place, and uh, for horizontal bar. You change from stack to cluster and apply. You know, and then you can see more information based on the bars, and then you can better calculate the percentages, the the comparative percentages there. This is almost like, you know, a normalized, normalized uh, graph. So this is a you know, relationship between the national plan and churn. But you know, in, in IBM, it does, have, it does have a niche graph type where it can elongate you know, uh, the, the bars to make them same length, but statistics don't change. With that in, you know, in, increase in length, the relative percentage stay the same, so the length of the red part also become longer. Now the benefits of that is you can compare very easily the relative percentages. So then you can see very directly, does it make a sense? It doesn't make a difference. You know, international plan makes a difference in terms of percentage of turners, right? Based on this chart. In SAS, we cannot do that. Um, I checked the uh, Excel, can even do, not do that Excel very easily. We have an Excel expert. Let's uh, bring in the knowledge. But uh, as far as I know, I don't, I don't see it. So this is IBM's advantage. But you know, it, it's usage just so much. You can calculate the percentage and then compare it. So it's not a necessity. It's just a nice feature to have. You know. So the conclusion is, um, international plan is an important variable to predict churn. And you know the direction that it goes, right? International plan makes people churn more. That's where the problem is. And uh, so the, this, you know, this is a um, contingency table 
if you're familiar with that. Or you can call it a pivot table, a cross tabulation table, different names. Uh, you may be more familiar with the word pivot. You know, pivot is where you have different categories, and then you show the statistics in the cells. Here, the statistic is the count, right? And you can show more. You can show the percentage. What does it say? So there are only two categories of international call, international plan, two categories of churn. So you have two by two, four different possibilities. Then you have four cells. Under each cell, there are different counts. You have the distribution of the, uh, of the people along the two variables. Based on this, you can calculate some statistics to quantify, to calculate, even statistically test if the two variables are correlated. That's a chi-square statistic, right? And uh, to, to make it visual, you know, um, understand the totals first. These are what? Subtotals. These are subtotals. This is grand total, right? Grand total is 3,000 something. These are row totals each corresponding to a condition of churn. The first row is when or all, all of them are non-churners, they stay with the company, and the majority of them, the grand majority of them, over 95% or 93% of them did not have the international <coughs> plan, and they, they stayed. 4% of them had international plan, they stayed. So within the non trainers percentage of using international plan is very minimal, right? But if you look at the churners, 483, out of those, about one, one third, I mean, no, about three, three fourths, about three fourths did not churn, about one fourth, 25%, or close to that, churned. So what does that tell you? Within the two conditions, we kind of see a difference. You know, percentage percentage of using international plan under turners are higher. Twenty eight percent, actually twenty eight percent, close to twenty five percent of turners used international plan, but only five percent of non turners had international plan. So international plan kind of made a difference. And uh, but that's not the only way you can calculate that. You can look at column-wise. So what does that mean? This, the first column is those who do not have international plan. The second column are those who, who have international plan. Subtotal, almost similar. But the way you interpret the, the correlation changes. Of those who do not have international plan, close to 90% did not churn. Out of 3,000, 2,600 did not churn. So 90% did not churn of those who do not have international plan. Of those who have, 300 people who have international plan, over half churned. No, no, over half did not churn, but uh, close to 40% churned. So 40% versus 10%, that's you know, clear difference of the outcome depending on the international plan. So you can look at both wise. The next slide shows you the, and we can do that uh, in a minute. Next slide shows you the column percentages. That, you know, percentage of this number out of that column subtotal. The difference between 42% churning of those who have international plan and 10% churning of those who do not have international plan. That's uh, you know, quite significant, uh, significant change of the outcome. Uh, to see this it, and to see the um, percentage, it's actually, you know, it's already there. If you bring up, I don't, I don't know if you can still bring it, the bring up, the stat explore. I don't have it, so I'll have to regenerate it. 
that explore look at the results and then if you look at the this lawn uh, results table there's a section beginning with class variable summary st summary statistics by class target so what does it do it shows you the percentages of the different levels of the class level like uh, international plan it shows you the percentage of yes or no international plan under each value of churn so under yes or no under true or false churn so now you have a two by two uh, contingency table and um, and uh, the percentages of those so let's say for these for international play the second one the first two columns the first two rows it's separate by churn result the first row is churn is false the second row is churn is true so similar to the table that I show you in the slide and then the column wise it shows the mode and the first mode is the majority of the case in terms of international play under each value of churn for non churners 93 percent do not do not have the international plan the mode is no for 6.5 percent this is a row wise percentage right because they add up to 100 for for those who do not have for those who do, do not churn 6.5 percent do have the international plan so it's a majority of them do not have but if you switch to churners close to 30 percent have the international plan so that plan probably made a difference in terms of the outcome so this is row wise uh row wise percentage not the column wise And uh, let's see. And uh, you have, uh, you know, you have bar charts, and also you have pie charts. Pie charts are nice because, you know, the 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 the, the, the circle is fixed I mean the degrees are fixed it's 360 degrees so it's naturally normalized for you so that's a good thing and then if you show the frequency by the side then you have both you have normalized percentages and then you have the uh, you know fixed uh, absolute counts so that would be nice let's make uh, some uh, pie charts this is still about international plan. So the same thing, but we're re, uh, generating different kinds of graph. So I will go back to the graph explorer again and make a graph. Make a pi, there's only one option. So for here, uh, things get twisted a little bit it's no longer that um, it's no longer the plan is the category it, 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 it kind of flipped but I don't know why it's just uh, I learned it so for category you choose turn to show the different colors so for turn you choose category for international plan you choose group and then there's nothing else to choose because it's a bar. It always show you the frequency and the percentage is visually very clear. I'm sorry, which graph are you using? For Pie chart. Pie chart. Yeah. And then churn is category. International plan is group. Again, minimize. So that's it. Okay, so let's see what we have. 
international plan no is the inner pi. International plan yes is the outer wheel. You know, you can't tell the, the count because they are all round. It doesn't mean the bigger circle has bigger things, has bigger counts. It's just, it, it's normalized. So you can see the percentage very clearly, reds or churners, right? So churners are higher if you have international plan. Is that confirmed? Yeah. For the outer ring, yeah, more percentages are churning because it's an international plan. So then same thing, you go to the graph options and bring up the labels, the values, axes, you know, the uh, legend. If you change the title, it will be a perfect graph. So again, the two colors are for churn and non-churn. So that separates the two groups within each circle, within each wheel. The inner wheel actually has uh, more counts based on the numbers. And clearly, it's only a minority of them churn because it, uh, they don't have international plan. For the other ring, majority, Close to half of them churn. So that's that's actually this is better than the bar chart, right? It shows you more information in a compact way. And well, the nice thing is we have this and that. The two things are same purpose, but we have we have more information in one graph in the in the pie chart. Yeah. It's not showing up on my graph. Like Maybe. Um, no, no, no. This is the legend title. Oh, yeah. So oh. you do have the term legend title. Oh, the, the title is the, the graph option. Okay. okay. All right. What else? Um, yeah, the pie chart. Okay, demo pie chart. I just did the. And so here, this is the bro percentages. So you can get this in static form, right? This is still international plan and the churn, you know, contingency table but the percentages are row percentages. The conclusion would be the same. Those who have the international plan tend to churn more. And what is this? And it has, it has things flipped. So, the, the categories now are true or false, or churn. And the two boards within, the two clusters within each result are uh, yes or no international plan. So you see, it's kind of uh, swap places. Does that make sense? Well, uh, let me show you what we made here. The basic categories are international plan. The two colors are true or false. But in that graph, it's flipped. The basic categories are true or false. And two bars are yes or no. So it's flipped. Can you quickly make this based on what we did? Yeah? Um, I'll show you. So let's. Uh, kind of flip that to the, this, this graph. So what you do is you go into data options and you simply swap you know, the row. 
So for turn, we'll choose category. And then the other is cleared because you can't have two categories. For international plan, we'll choose group. See? Now, now we only have one giant bark, and then we have three smaller uh, bars. And same thing as the graph shows. Can you make pie charts and, and switch their position? Same thing, same thing. So finally, the conclusion, we did all these different graphs. Conclusion is international plan has to be in the model. It's important. And I'll just show you one last thing before we close. In the stat explorer, you know, it does not only show you summary statistics in this big, you know, comprehensive results window. It also shows ranked graphs of importance of variables. To the, to the left, where the word is larger or the chi-square is higher, the two are kind of corresponding with each other. These are the most important variables. They charge. Kind of, you know, based on the graph, it's, it's harder to read, but the charge, day charge, instead of evening charge. Or night charge. Night charge. It's here. It's very significant. It's harder to detect. It's harder to quantify, you know, because there are many, many levels. But this gives you a snapshot. Day charge, day mean, same thing. <coughs> but if you include both, it's as if you're including only one because they carry the same information. Customer service calls? Yeah. The point? Yeah. International plan? And state, even. The state may have some problem, you know? Yeah. yeah and too many levels. International minutes and international charge. And these are com comparably less important. So that's it for today. Um, I haven't done all of them, but uh, I'll do some. I'll, I'll choose some important things to highlight next next week. I won't do all of them next uh, next week because it's taking a lot of time. Uh, you can follow along. If you have seen me do do all of these. You have followed. You are equipped. You can do these, recreate these things uh, on, your, on yourself. Right. And the best thing today's class. Is recorded. What does that mean? You have the voice. I'm not sure uh, the quality of the voice. Hopefully, it's good. And you have all the uh, videos. So you can go back to see what I did and how I did. You have the entire session. Okay. I'll I'll post it. You know the way like the way I post it uh, on YouTube and uh, create a link in. Uh, Blackboard. You will see it. Uh, at least you know, before the end of the week, you will see it. Uh, Daniel. Not Daniel, sorry. Brian. <laughs> if you have more questions, I can help you. Okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll probably do